Thank you, Deb, and welcome again to working with veteran service organizations. Just a few housekeeping items, and we will uh, introduce you to our presenters, and we'll get underway. So as you probably noticed, the phones are muted. As Debbie mentioned earlier, we have about 150 registrants, so we expect a large turnout. So to reduce background noise and make this a more pleasant experience, we've got all the phones muted. Uh, we'd like to ask you to, if you have a question or would like to make, like to make a comment, to use the chat panel that should be on the right side of your screen. Uh, please, when you send a chat, send it to all participants so that all of us can see it. You have someone else out there who would like to ask the same question. So we'd like to all be able to see it and on to it. We have opportunities for questions throughout the presentation. Uh, we'll also handle those via the chat at the very end. If there's time, we might open up the phone for anyone who prefers to ask questions that way, but we'll, we'll see how we're doing. Uh, at the very end, after we close out the webinar, you'll be prompted to take a couple of surveys, one from WebEx and one from us. Please do be sure to take time to answer both of those as we will be doing more of these webinars and uh, want to make them as useful and effective as you can. What we'd like to do now is learn a little bit about you. Uh, she is going to open up a poll that asks you some questions. You should see that appearing on the right side of the screen. So uh, what am you with and your experience working with veteran service organizations? While you're completing that poll, Debbie, if you'd like to go ahead and advance to the next slide, uh, please go ahead and continue to complete the poll. Uh, but while you're doing that, let's hear from our presenters. And Amari, would you like to just give a brief introduction to yourself? Certainly. Thank you so much, Eric and Debbie. This is Margie Legowski. I'm at the Corporation for National and Community Service here in Washington, D.C. I work in the strategy office, and as the person who is the lead on with um, Kobe Langley and all of the good work that he and Teresa and Bob and others, including Wall, are doing in the field of veterans and military service and military families. Uh, I'd like to just turn it to Teresa right now. Teresa, could you introduce yourself, and then could you turn it over to Bob to introduce himself? Sure. Margie, hi. I'm Teresa Long, and I work with the Corporation for National and Community Service. I'm the Oklahoma State Director, and also work closely with Kelly Langley and um, others of the veteran uh, focus area. I also serve um, for Corporation as the National Deputy Representative on the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs Volunteer Service Advisory Committee. And so I'll turn it over to Bob. <laughs> It's, uh, oh, Bob's connecting in. Looks like his connection might be a little rough. Uh, while we wait for Bob to connect back in, um, I think we've given folks enough time to complete the poll. Why don't we go ahead and see who's on the phone with us? Okay, let's see. So WebEx is just uh, doing some questions here. Someone to go read their email. Do <laughs> um, you want to uh, give a quick introduction, Bob? Well, my name is Bob Reeg. I'm the project director of the American Legion Auxiliary Call to Service Corps. And it's our um, 
investment of resources from AmeriCorps National and AmeriCorps VISTA. We have members in service in almost 30 organizations around the country, and they're performing a variety of capacity building functions to um, build the capability of the organizations to improve resources and services to military service members, veterans, and their families. Thank you. And uh, just looking at our poll results, it looks like we have a broad mix of experience with working with uh, veteran service organizations as well as good rotations from our different national service streams. So it looks like some good representation from Senior Corps in particular. Uh, looks like we have some veterans and members, military family members on the call with us. So we look forward to your perspective, uh, and then kind of a range of experience of working with veteran service organizations. So hopefully this presentation will hit the sweet spot, um, giving some new ideas to the folks that have some experience working with VSOs as well as kind of a good primer and uh, set of actions for those of you that are new to partnering with VSOs or would like to consider it. So I think with that, why don't we and the last question here, number five, are you currently working with a VSO? About 30% of you said you are. At the end of this session, Bob and Teresa were going to share some examples. So if any of you want to share out what's been going on for you, that will be a place for you to share some of the good stuff you're doing in the field as time allows. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to our presenters. So uh, you might hear from Debbie and myself later in the presentation, but right now um, let's hand it over to Margie if you could give us kind of the framing of this session and the outcome. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Eric. It's very fitting that this session take place during the week of Memorial Day. And I know that many of you, particularly those in the world of Senior Corps and VISTA, have been working with veteran service organizations and serving with and serving veterans and military families for a very long time. This is really, um, this webinar is part of a series of webinars that we're sharing with you at the end of each month so that everyone in the national service world who isn't quite as familiar with some of the groups and the priorities and issues of veterans and military families can learn information that will help them to be successful in their programs. You know that this is a priority for the corporation, and it's largely a priority because we'll be seeing the return of many of our veterans in the next couple of years, and their families are currently in need of support. So the timing of this webinar and this whole emphasis is very, very important. This is really, and I'm, I'm interested in this poll because you can see that there are a few folks who aren't familiar with veterans service organizations. So we're going to kind of go through, this is a primer, the basics about what they are, um, kind of characteristics, the trends currently in those organizations, um, the opportunities and challenges for collaboration with them. And I know this is important in particular for the folks in Senior Corps because many of you are lining up your programs in this direction in the coming year. And um, also our friends, Teresa and Bob are going to talk a little bit about how do you actually form a collaboration with ESO and, and what are some examples of what that might look like. We hope that at the end of this hour you'll have a sense of what a veteran service organization is and isn't, what their purposes are so that you can decide what lines up with your work, and then imagine possible collaborations with VSOs and kind of know what the immediate next step is. So. Thank you very much, and I'm really looking forward to learning with you today. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to our colleagues, and I believe this would be Teresa. Thank you, Margie. Um, good, everyone, and thank you again for taking time to participate. And I'd like to give a special thank you. Um, Margie said, as we are in Memorial Day week, a special thank you to all the veterans that are on the phone. Thank you so much for all your service to our country. So what is a veteran organization? You hear the term a lot, but you hear kind of bannered about a lot, but um, sometimes kind of confused on what a, a veteran service organization actually is. But VSOs are private 
nonprofit organizations that have been designated as 501c19 by IRS and are organized in the U.S. Organizations is comprised of past or present members of the U.S. Armed Forces, military cadets, or relatives of members of the Armed Forces. Examples um, would be the American Legion, American Legion Auxiliary, Veteran Foreign Wars, or Disabled American Veterans. That's with any nonprofit, part of the organization's earnings may benefit a shareholder or individual. Organizations must operate exclusively for one or more purposes, and we'll talk a little bit about that in some upcoming, uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. Some of the VOs also have auxiliaries. They might have trust. They might also have a foundation that helps them um, for resources for programs and services. And if they do, those are also all classified as 501c19. Again, as I said, a lot of times you hear the term veteran service organization apply to kind of all encompassing organizations that are providing services to veterans and military families. Only those that have received the distinction as a veteran service organization by IRS are actually what would be SO. For example, some government agencies or service providers that are not membership based. Maybe Operation Homefront or the Mission Continues are often that terms often used to refer to those organizations, but are not an actual VSO by definition. So, topology of the the VSO sector: um, there are approximately 100 top tier VSOs, and when you account for their state and local affiliates, the numbers are the U.S. are well into the thousands. Generally, they can be grouped um, some of their shared characteristics. You might uh, membership type is the membership uh, comprised of service members themselves, like with VW and Disabled American Veterans, or are they relatives of veterans like the American Auxiliary and VFW Auxiliary? Um, what membership size? Are they a large organization like the American Legion with over 3 million members nationwide, or are they smaller um, in size like maybe the Polish Legion of American Veterans that have very limited uh, membership based upon the characteristics of uh, the members themselves? Or um, also can be grouped by the period of military service like Vietnam veterans or Iraq veterans, uh, World War II veterans. Um, or the organization H. Organizations like the American Legion and VFW have been in existence for over 90 years. So there's a, a wide range of different uh, heuristics that veteran service organizations share. And so to Bob now to talk a little bit more about some of the. Everyone, I hope I'm being heard. I see my speaker says I'm speaking now. So, um, again, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. I appreciate the opportunity to um, talk to you about some of my experience with a VSO. The, the American Legion Auxiliary is uh, affiliated with the American Legion, which is a charter, congressionally chartered. Under and also we hire a status 501c19. So um, hopefully my remarks today um, give you a window on in the VSL world from someone who who works directly with one. So um, some of the trends that are happening in the VSO sector currently there are some um, asset-based trends and some asset-based trends. Um, one of the trends that people probably are well aware of just by um, the visual uh, example of um, we see in the media around veteran groups is gene membership or um, some of the members declining. That has to do um, with somewhat what Teresa was mentioning about age of some of our organizations. Um, American Legion, for example, was formed in World War I. World War One, so um, 
um, World War veterans have passed, but there are certainly plenty of World War II veterans, but we've had veterans throughout our nation's history, and therefore um, a lot of older people, because we've been in service since the Revolutionary War. So, um, so, so that's one dynamic going on is that, um, and particularly the appearance of a veterans group may look like and look look older than the full membership, and that's um, part of cultural cultural situations and how um, our societies changed from being group public events to online social media bowling alone kind of moment. So. Again, some of the visual doesn't necessarily reflect reality, but but nonetheless, it's um, it's end that to be aware of as you're doing your planning. All, um, I mean, some of the aging is due to I mean the organization ages and may die out because the um, work period that the organization represents um, has has um, cut its lifespan, so to speak. Remember. Um, Last year, the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association had its last um, commemoration at, on Pearl Harbor Day in Hawaii because there are very few members left to sustain the organization. So um, that's that's something to be aware of. On the other side, there are um, a great sense of need with uh, from VSOs. So that's because we have a new generation of Veterans. Of course, we have veterans all every day of the year. Someone becomes a veteran. Um, I think we're again familiar with the idea. Of there's a lot, lot of people becoming veterans currently because so many have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. But we also have um, we have people who leave active duty on a daily basis that haven't been deployed overseas. Um, the bottom line is that there is a heightened awareness. There is a heightened number of veterans because of the wars that were um, in Exodine, and that consequently there's an um, increased demand for resources and services from VOs. Um, when you see on the slide USAF, it's referring to US, United States Armed Forces, not solely United States Air Force. <laughs> Uh, the third is that um, the organizations are um, typically trying to modernize to respond to the current um, current pool of veterans and make their resources and services available remotely and electronically and in other ways that are friendly to how people live and learn in the 21st century. So, um, and as, as Teresa highlighted, there are certainly a number of new organizations emerging that support service members and veterans that didn't exist even five years ago. They do not have formal 501c19 status. They may be seeking that. They may not. It just depends. Um, there's all sorts of legal uh, reasons to do so or not do so and to get orders from Congress and not. Those are all kind of periphery. Um, so I would encourage us to think globally about VSOs, it's certainly today we're um, attending the 501c19 class, but if a group is veterans and feels like calling themselves a veteran service organization and isn't being stopped from doing so, anybody, um, you know, we welcome and embrace them as, as organizations supporting our veterans and our military. Slide, please. Um, the service organizations have um, sole purposes. Um, these are defined in the U.S. Code um, as the criteria that a organization has to have in place in order to be um, qualified as a 501c19 veteran service organization. So I thought that would be a helpful framework for um, analyzing what veteran service organizations do. And I will go through these slides and give an example or two for um, each. And if um, any of you are on the phone, want to comment and chat of an example of a veteran service organization you're aware of that correspond with these, um, so please do, and you can share that information with your peers. Um, one of the primary functions of a VSO is actually pretty broad. 
but it's for my social welfare of the community. So that statute is something that VETOs are entitled to do. As you'll see, um, that's a broader purpose than simply supporting veterans, service members, or relatives of veterans and service members. Um, the takeaway from that bullet point is that um, historically, some veteran service or many veteran service organizations have engaged in community service beyond um, taking care of their own, so to speak, and that. That, um, might provide some opportunities for collaboration with organizations um, who are just on this call today that have a, a purpose or mission um, beyond veteran or military only. Um, in other words, VSOs can be um, really effective community partners. And um, one example of this is AMVETS, or a VSO that's open to anyone who's currently serving or is honorably served in the U.S. Armed Forces from World War II to the present. And one thing they do is they encourage their posts and departments to volunteer and support their local Special Olympic chapters. Specifically, um, sons may participate in Special Olympics, but Special Olympics is for all Olympians with special capabilities. So that's an example of a VSO of supporting a community effort. Another example um, is that of what VSOs can do is assist disabled and needy war veterans and members of the United States Armed Forces and their dependents and the widows and orphans of deceased veterans. So that would be like your classic understanding of what a VSO does. And I must say that um, more VSOs are returning to this some um, focus more um, concretely and laser beamed than um, in time periods where sometimes VSOs felt like they were looking for something to do now have um, a heightened awareness of the of the needs of the veteran and military community again and VSOs themselves are experiencing that and focusing more on um, to care of their own so to speak example of this um, in action is Blinded Veterans Association and they're a VSO that's formed as veterans of their families challenged by blindness and have a peer support program that connects combat blinded veterans or war periods with new blinded veterans who've been wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is an example for you. Um, next slide, please. A purpose of VSOs is to provide entertainment, care, and assistance to hospitalized veterans or members of the United States Armed Forces. Um, a prominent example of that is United Service Organizations, or USO. Um, they're a congressionally chartered private nonprofit organization. And among their many programs, they organize celebrity entertainment tours to boost the morale of troops in times of peace and war. Um, so that hits on the entertainment piece. A number of those have. Um, create programs where they mobilize their members to be volunteers to hospitalize veterans in VA medical centers or um, home-based care to um, care caregivers, respite care for caregivers or home-based services to veterans who don't need hospitalization. So um, that, that's how that bullet becomes live. Uh, another prominent function is um, for VSOs as they carry on programs to perpetuate the memory of deceased veterans and members of the United States Armed for them to comfort their survivors. Um, an example of that is Gold Star Wives of America. Um, they're an organization of widows and widowers whose spouses died while on active duty in the military service or as all of a military service connected cause. And um, that organization assist those and widowers in understanding and obtaining benefits provided by Congress for survivors. Another example of VSO activities is, again, a broader purpose than just veteran or military specific. Um, they are authorized um, and conduct programs for religious, charitable, scientific, literary, or educational purposes. Probably language that covers all nonprofits, so I can't say that for sure. But, but that's a pretty broad umbrella that I'm sure 501c3s and 
safely into that that category. So again, um, 501c19 can be more than just military and veteran, although we're emphasizing that their primary activity is toward veterans and military. An example of this is the veterans of foreign wars in the United States um, and offer a voice, the Voice Democracy, a scholarship program that's an audio essay contest for high school students. Through that program, they uh, provide more than $3 million in scholarships. So, um, give you an example of how VSOs are supporting the larger community. Uh, slide, please. Activity of VSOs is to sponsor or participate in activities of a patriotic nature. Oh, God, I can't imagine a VSO that doesn't do that. And if you uh, saw any of the uh, patriotic observances of this past Memorial Day, you would have seen um, groups marching in parades and participating in um, ceremonies at uh, cemeteries and, and public memorials and um, participate in that fashion. Another activity VSOs can do is provide insurance benefits to their members. Um, I think all of this is a retired enlisted association and they're organized to enhance quality of life for uniformed services and enlisted personnel, their families and survivors, and um, that organization organizes a package of insurance options. That's probably an area that's not going to be an area for um, collaboration unless you're an organization that provides insurance that wants um, to pair up with an organization that can offer it, but it's a, an example of the type of support that um, VSOs are authorized to provide their own membership. And finally, um, VSOs are um, authorized to provide social and recreational activities for members. An example of this is the Marine Corps League. Um, they have um, their their membership organization of active duty and veterans of the United States Marine Corps. And they organize birthday balls in locations around the country to celebrate the birthday to the United States Marine Corps. Sometimes the social and recreational activity gets a little pooed by the general community that um, that's just a group that gets together to drink um, is sometimes set about some veteran service organizations, particularly those that have um, locations in the community that have a hospitality function and response back when I hear that, that um, remark is A, those um, hospitality events or fundraisers for the organization. They use those um, funds earned from those activities to support their activities um, with veterans in the larger community. And um, second, it's important to have the social and recreational opportunities within the VSOs as, as an organization because that builds the solidarity that allow, allow people when they're doing service and other mission work to do it in the spirit of happiness and, um, um, you know, happiness and comfort. So there's nothing wrong with um, soul and recreational activities. And as I said, they're often either connected to a service event or used to fundraise for service events. Um, I see one really good question about um, this um, set of slides, so I'll answer it now. It's the RVSOs required to perform a certain number of these activities or are just general guidelines? Um, and their general guidelines, there's not a um, requirement that a VO all or um, a percentage of them in order to be constituted as a VSO, but they would at least do one. Um, otherwise, they would likely just be a regular nonprofit. Um, okay, I think that there are questions at this time about what VSOs do or anyone on the phone would like to share an example from their community. Um, please feel free to do that in the chat feature. Um, we'll be opening the call at the end for questions, so if you want to um, verbalize some of your thoughts about what SOs do in your community, you can hold your remarks for that time. Floyd, um, I think, is 
this is okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I mean, we try to sell a context of who VSOs are and also the type of um, source work they do in their community or nationally. Uh, now we will um, highlight a little bit about some of the opportunities to collaborate and um, what some benefits are as well as the um, challenges to doing so. Uh, end of opportunities, and this is probably where people really want to um, own in on today because you're all here to um, learn collaboration and you can partner up with this organizations to accomplish service objectives that are in the Serve America Act and the Corporation Strategic Plan and, and in your and your checks and performance measures and things. So um, these are all the points that highlight some advantages to linking up to a veteran service organization to help you meet the purposes that you have. Um, one is the membership themselves. It's, um, VSOs, by definition, are comprised of service members, veterans, or their families. Now, there are veteran service organizations that are just for service members, not for veterans. So the, the term is veteran service organization. Um, the membership could be active, active service members only or guard members only and things like that. So um, the, they called it military and veteran service organization. But nonetheless, um, be aware that the term VSO does um, include um, people currently in service and their families as well as people who served. Um, but the important point for you all is if you're looking to do work with veterans or with the military community, um, link to a VSO is a great way to find your, your customer base. Um, the second advantage that a VSO brings into a collaboration is that they, because of their membership and their history and their connection to the military and veteran sector, know something about the armed forces, or they know something about veterans. Um, that's really critical for those of us in national service who want to respond to the needs and challenges and assets of that community, but don't know a lot about them. And so a lot of um, goodwill without a lot of knowledge, and so it's bringing you all's goodwill and matching it to knowledge of an organization that, that has its um, roots in this community. Straight from my previous um, comments, that VSOs offer an array of programs and services for um, service members and their veterans. And some of them are um, educational related, employment related, healthcare related, others are social and recreational. All of them have a mission of service. Um, and so what each one offers varies. Some of them offer a boutique set of programs very specific to their own ship where there won't be good opportunities to link to that. The can um bring programs and services available to the wider community. So uh plenty of options potentially to plug into that's based on what they're already doing. VSOs have a um, typically have a sterling reputation in the community. I think that's a, um, a fallout or a spin-off of the generally high regard reputation that veterans and service members have among um, among the American people. And so, um, and as we feel pretty good about our troops and our veterans and our pride their service and grateful for their service and view them as outstanding citizens, that parlays into reputation of the organizations that represent them. So getting with them is typically a safe, um, you know, it's a feel safer to, to organizations that don't know much about the veterans, but yeah, if I latch on to their efforts, I'm probably in good debt. I feel pretty proud that our members are highly committed to the causes, both um, advocacy, which we don't deal with as service uh, organizations on the phone, but um, 
the advocacy function that many of the VSOs perform does create a culture of commitment and commit long term and um, stick to itness and that goes into the uh, um, commitment to service. As, and also commitment to service over the long term. We tend to um, form relationships and pick programs that stay a while where we don't turn off a lot of light switches. But we don't turn a lot on, but we also don't turn a lot off. So um, that's the commitment is of the individual and the organization. And finally, uh, um, the those often have structured mechanisms to involve whole families and um, in in the um, services and activities. For example, Teresa had mentioned earlier that a number of VSOs have auxiliaries, so that was a opportunity for relatives of the eligible member, the eligible veteran or service member, to, to have a role to play in the organization's health and well-being. Um, others of them have. Um, um, plus or chapters or groups for the young people. For example, the auxiliary has a, a, dimension of, a, a category of membership that are called our junior members. So those are um, girls 18 and under that are able to affiliate with the auxiliary and have special programming for um, to meet their developmental needs. So um, typically, um, the, typically the VSOs have some ways that family and friends can connect into the VSOs activities, and therefore, by partnering with a best service organization, you may not get just one volunteer. You may get four or five, depending if you successfully provide it, your um, target beneficiary or your target volunteer um, brings along with them. Uh, next slide, please. And while switching, I, I do I want to acknowledge there are some questions coming in, and we will get to them. So um, keep firing away. Um, um, and if I'm Teresa and Margie, you want to look at them as well and be prepared to respond. That's great. So some of the challenges to working with a veteran service organization, um, I would like to think these are not challenges unique to our sector, but um, they are challenges with our sector. So of them. Once um, many of the VSOs have distinct structures that concentrate power in a few individuals, we often have like pretty large connotation bodies, um, rather of you know one from each state or so many from each state, depending on. This is a national level. Typically, I'm describing that um, because we have a pretty broad constitution and convention structure and you can't really mobilize a thousand people to make uh, every decision, particularly every big decision, it sometimes gets condensed into a few individuals that really get all the shots. And they're elected officials. Um, these are nonprofits with director, so to speak. We may not call them that, but these are, you know, these are organizations that are run and overseen by volunteers. To, some of them have staff, some of them don't, but but um, there is, you know, a representation of the overall membership making the decision, but, but uh, sometimes our, our, our size or our history um, has all uh, to the point where the decision gets concentrated and not necessarily anybody from the floor can decide to become and we must do collaboration. So probably a safety feature um, in a good way, um, but it's, it's one of who, who, who the player is. Um, also, uh, also, our leadership structures rotate with frequency. Uh, many VSOs have a annual terms for their leadership. So um, typically have some sort of advancement. Um, so someone who's going to be the leader has um, had um, a roles prior to that that are putting them on the pathway to leadership. So um, you can a flavor of who's who's going to be making decisions and start influencing them before they're the decider, but, but 
where the decider they have this golden moment of opportunity to make their act. So um, it's and to recognize the life cycle of our volunteers. All VSOs have formal policy setting processes with many stages and deadlines. Again, these um, organizations typically have um, um, a very structured and elaborate mechanism for making policy decisions, whether they're called policy statements or resolutions or agreements, and, and they don't just happen by one person um, deciding. That, I mean, sometimes we, I mean, I, I'm kind of contradicting myself. I realize a lot of times the um, controlling decision of what to bring forward is one or a few people, but sometimes what's brought forward does need to get ratified by the entire organization represent some large elected body and so um, a kind of um, effort has to go through a number of stages and really important as you're thinking about collaboration is figuring out well how is this going to be for us and for them and therefore how big of a decision is this going to be for our VSO collaborator and even further than how how much lead time are we going to have to build in to make sure all the um, process stages are, are completed. Um, another caution is that is the VSOs tend to tend toward insularity, somewhat again based on the population that we represent and. and Probably not been struggling if you're in the civilian side. Like, how come these groups won't work with us? And um, some of that's because um, there were in our history where the American people generally weren't just, just tripping over themselves to take care of veterans and service members. And, and certainly the military community has a structure in place when you're in service of, of, of a support for itself. And so the um, tendency has been for um, the veteran, veteran and community to take care of itself and hide its problems, so to speak. And so um, that manifests itself in our organizations as well. I think the um, really push coming from so many cores of society, including the Obama administration, but um, the corporation and then um, on and on, the media, the um, celebrities, everyone saying let's all work together and be helpful is changing that that dynamic um, and also um, last point in terms of a challenge is it's, it's maybe a blessing for you all working locally or um, not if you're a national group um, it kind of cuts both ways but often the VSO structure the affiliates the local chapters or the state chapters are legally autonomous from the um, from the headquarters, and so um, just because headquarters suggests to do something doesn't mean everybody at the ground is wired to. Um, also, that means that local activities may bubble but not get a lot of national support for them because they weren't national initiatives. So, again, it could be a benefit. Um, to get something done a little quicker, or it could be a deficit depending on what's the relationship of the local chapter to its um, headquarters, and and you'll want to kind of explore that as you're um, as you're approaching collaboration and conversations with the VSO at the local level, as kind of a sense of how how gated they are to to national office and that may indicate whether they're going to be able to participate or not. Uh, so I think we're moving on. Next slide. So actually, I'm going to jump in real quick, Bob. This is Eric. Um, as you mentioned, we have had some questions come in. Um, we thought maybe before Teresa starts talking about forming collaborations with VSOs, we could try to take a few of those. That's Good idea. So the and first question, you moderate those, Eric. And um, as Bob mentioned earlier, please do continue to send in your questions via the chat. When you do, please send it to all participants. That way, all of 
our presenters can see it. Uh, it was one from Martin, which I don't think all presenters saw, so I'll just read it. Um, he asked, how involved are VSOs in war memorial restoration activities? Is anyone taking the lead nationally? I'm aware of a national movement on that. I, I, I see calls sometimes from organizations that are wanting that in their community, and we, we connect that through their local chapter or their state chapter and um, look to that way. Obviously, some of the major national monuments, such as the World War II Memorial and, and um, Vietnam Memorial, the, the kind of national signature memorials have had um, a lot of support from um, national veteran service organizations. But typically, the um, mills that are set up in parks, parks and places and communities around the country um, come from um, um, a community-wide mobilization that includes the VSOs from that local community. So do you have any observations on that, that as well? I would agree that from, from experience knowledge, I mean, it's, those activities are really driven at the, the local level. Um, you might check with the, the local mayor's office or chamber of commerce. Um, they, you know, probably would have um, kind of, you know, contact information on who to, to get involved with on that. I know in the community, my hometown, um, the a Veterans Memorial, that the, the, those kind of drove the process, but it also um, involved the, the mayor's office and then there's a small mu um, historical museum in the community, and they were involved, but the, the local VSOs, Kind of collaboratively led the process and are the ones that you know are in charge of keeping it you know cleaned and, and everything. So you know that might be a starting point for you at at your local mayor's office or um, with chamber of commerce to to see if they get information on kind of who's who's leading charge on that. Uh, why don't we take a question from Paula Burnett? Uh, this sounds like it might be more. And Margie or Teresa's wheelhouse, could VSOs count as RSVP stations for operation programming, or are they simply to be utilized as a collaborator? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, um, there are some RSVP programs that are partnering with service organizations in their community as a station. I know um, there are some that are working with. For example, um, disabled American veterans, counting that as a station where they're providing volunteers to serve as, as uh, transportation drivers, uh, partner with the DAV. Um, we also have um, programs that are working as um, other organizations to utilize volunteers to out to veterans regarding um, access to services. Um, we one program that was piloted in Washington State actually with Department of Labor Veterans Program and then also involved the American Legion and RSVP volunteers. And the, the volunteers were um, collecting veterans within the community that were provided to them by Department of Labor. And the RSVP volunteers were that make calls and do outreach to those veterans to um, see what kind of services that they were actually in need of. It actually started as uh, trying to contact them regarding, like, if they're unemployed or underemployed, but then as the process it grew into more of, you know, what actual services that they need, they may need something other than, you know, assistance with employment training. So it's morphed into this this larger program. Um, so, yes, I mean, it, it could go both ways. I mean, it certainly presents a, a great opportunity for an RSVP program to work with an earned service organization as a workstation, but it, you know, it also could be just an opportunity for collaboration depending on what your individual community needs are and what your program needs are. 
Uh, there was a question from Nicole about asking if there are survey results outlining the number of veterans who served with CNCS programs in recent years. Um, Mark, you may be able to answer that. I, I do believe there is uh, um, some information about the number of AmeriCorps um, service participants who indicated veteran status, but um, sure, sure. Um, we're in the process of collecting that information as kind of a baseline because it is a priority for us. And I can tell you, for example, that we have uh, 78 Vista projects that focus on veterans and military families with 315 Vista members. So that work we haven't captured that data in the past, so it's only recently that we have begun to capture who of members and volunteers are veterans themselves. So um, when I get that information, I will put it on the forum attached to this webinar so that other folks can see it. Okay? So I don't have that. It's something that we've been trying to get. Also, I just want to um, have that I, I, there have been a number of um, efforts in the Veterinary Family Knowledge Network, and that's probably the best place that will all land where those of us who've been successful in identifying some um, veterans or um, active military service members, um, such as our members not on duty, active duty, or reservist, um, we've been um, really starting to pull together some suggestions on um, strategies for recruitment. So um, look to Knowledge Network um, as a future resource for those kind of tips and suggestions. I mean, I don't think there's ever going to be an official publication of how to how to recruit a veteran into national service, but us that are either so intentionally or um, luck to have that happen because of the focus of our project or, or trying to put put forward some recommendations for others of you. And I and I agree with uh -huh. No, I was just gonna say I just to pick off of what Mars saying about the data collection that we are working on baseline figuring out and then for those of you that are corporation grantees um, the implementing performance measures. One of the performance measures in number of veterans that are participating. So that as those numbers start rolling up in the next few, we will be able to have more data that will go for baseline that we're working on right now. Okay, uh, one more question and then launch into the next section. Um, thanks, folks, for sending in the questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can in this session. If we can't get to, we'll, we'll save a script of our chat and follow up with you afterwards. But I think this might be a good one because both uh, Annette and uh, Carrie mentioned this idea of VSOs uh, maybe being in a little bit of competition. They're competing for program participants. So uh, are there any suggestions on how to reframe the relationship um, so as to create a more collaborative and less competitive environment? So, I mean, that's a fair, um, a fair um, concern. Um, you have to distinguish what lead services you offer compared to what a veteran service organization offers. Um, the service organizations that are chartered by Congress have um, some permanent and also responsibility to represent veterans in benefit cases before the Department of Veterans Affairs. So, um, but they're not necessarily licensed. So you want to Discern or differentiate between public benefit assistance and appeal from from that that doesn't have to be legal aid. <laughs> so I don't know. You you know your community how you understand legal services more than I do, but I could see why VSOs would feel a little um, turfy about that if they're already if they're so responsible for providing that in their community. So you may want to have a, a you know, front conversation about, well, 
what are some things that you all don't do that we do, or also do you have more need than you can support when the sum of your overflow cases? Those would be two strategies I could come up with. I said, also, you, you probably ought to address this Teresa Volta question because it, it attaches to the other one about RSVP stations. That stations must be for the C threes. Municipalities are proprietary health care. Um, I will, um, as we are moving to increase our collaboration with VSOs, I will get some clarification from Senior Corps. I know that we, we have a representative Senior Corps on the the session, but I don't believe that she's able to respond to a question at this point in time. So I will get some some clarification on that, and then we'll post it um, in with the the follow up um, questions at the that I get posted with this on the forum. Great. Um, Bob started to touch on this. So how do you approach these organizations as potential partners? So with that, uh, Teresa, do you want to lead us in our discussion of forming collaborations with VSOs. All right, so um, our next section we're going to, um, as Eric just said, focus a little bit on, on collaborating with the VSOs. We're going to touch on each one of these bullet points individually, but um, some of the topics we're going to cover are know what your intentions of the collaboration are, how to identify appropriate VSO partners, how to who is identifying the proper point of contact, um, how to make organization introductions, developing your project proposal, and how to formalize the collaboration. Well, um, the first, um, the first step is know know what you want to accomplish, know your own intentions. I think uh, there's always a danger when there's some new new theme of the day or the year, and everyone. I mean, let's you know, can be a little bit honest on the phone call. A lot of organizations are reading RFPs, but not just in corporations, but in other sectors where veteran and military is highlighted as a priority or a preference because of the um, era of um, in our country's history. Uh, welcome, but it means everybody saying, I got to do something. I got to do something. And so there's a danger in that to up an idea just to get to get the pipeline, and so I really counsel our, the auxiliary, but also any anyone who wants to listen to me that we still need to be intentional about what what hoping to accomplish for the target population, and, and make we make sure that the investment, whether it's private or public investment, is used best. And so it's important before you approach a pro veteran service organization and get a handle on what you what you hope from that. So that might be need volunteer more volunteers in your organization. Hey, this is a group that has a lot of people like to volunteer and do service. So I may want to approach a VSO to say one of for volunteers to your own service work. You want to be looking at, at uh, you have a pool of volunteers. We want to match them to people with needs and think that there may be some veterans or service members with the needs that your members or volunteers or staff are able to address so that you would um, um, want to map around that. It might be um, kind of piggybacking on the question about legal services, I mean, you have a real niche, uh, a niche area that has some specialty or expertise that you're pretty sure that, that the veteran service organization itself doesn't offer or wouldn't have the capability of offering. So, um, again, kind of going beyond matching just general volunteers to general service needs is kind of later beaming in on your a specific human service capability. And, and, and the fourth consideration is where you 
hope to engage? Are you looking at a local collaboration in a specific town or city? Or are you looking at something regional? Are you looking at statewide? Or are you a, a organization seeking to influence um, activity across state boundaries? So those would be the four things I could think of to ask yourselves. And not just ask yourselves, but make a decision on. on Determine your so you can't go to another place if your collaborating part collaborating your potential wants to go somewhere else. But just to someone up and say, "Hey, I'm here to help," doesn't really um, get very far. Uh, so there's some slides to emphasize that. Uh, next slide is Teresa. Uh, and a, an appropriate partner. Um, this question comes up, you know, a lot we feel that in, in the offices now that there's, as an agency-wide larger focus on partnering with uh, providing services to veterans. That's one of the biggest things. So where can I find organizations in my community? Um, you heard Bob talk a little bit about um, the structure of veteran service organizations. Most of them have a, a national um, organization and then um, broken down into maybe a state affiliate and then even at the local level. So in your local community, you know, one of the, the first is to start is, you know, I mean, it sounds pretty rudimentary, but just the phone book. I mean, what are their, what are the organizations listed in in your own individual community? You might also check, um, as a while ago, maybe the mayor's office or with the Chamber of Commerce. They know um, kind of who those community leaders are. Typically, the leader in the veteran service organizations, especially in the smaller rural communities, are usually the leaders within the community themselves. So they um, connect you on where to go. In some organizations, depending on the community, you know, their the American region might be more active in one community, and another community it might be the VFW might be the, the one that's, that's most active in the community. Um, you have a, um, a VA medical center within your service area. You might also make um, touch base with the director of voluntary service. Typically, they're going to know who the, the leaders are because those individuals uh, are active uh, in the community. Um, and the, the, um, we go back to the previous slide. <laughs> also, we put up a link to um, on the the VA website. They have where you can search veteran service organizations. So you can put that in and check for organizations within your community. And then also, organizations um, serve compile they have available that you can look and for. Okay. <laughs> we had Bob for this slide, but uh, Teresa touched on some of these resources as well, such as the VA Medical Center. Anything I want to add, Bob, about um, I find potential VA partners? Uh, um all three county has a veteran service officer. The um, so one of the, where to start. You could also go to your county veteran service officer. Now those are to public employees of some entity in a county government, but um, they would also be a great resource to say, well, who who are the nonprofits that are active? Who are the Who's who's this uh, who's this county veteran service officer make referrals to um, for um, vet needs that the county veteran service officer isn't able to meet um, themselves. All of the um, um, all workforce centers in the country, all most most workforce investment centers or workforce readiness centers, job centers, whatever they're called in your community, but it's part of the workforce investment at one stop um, 
network that um, typically have employees there that are assigned to um, supporting veterans called them local veteran employment representatives. So that would be another um, key performance that could um, um, have, have a good lay of the land about, about veteran service organizations that are active. Also, I always encourage people to go to an actual event and see who's marching down the road. The road. It's a group of two people in a banner, and then there's another one behind that's 100. You may or maybe you're going to get a little more action from the group of the 100 than the group with the two. So um, some of it's just actually looking at what their hats say and sitting with somebody after after events over and when people are break from the event and, and intro themselves. And um go to the next slide. Um once once you've kind of did an organization in your community, then how do you get in to the actual proper point of contact is? Most of these organizations have a, a, on the national level, they're going to likely have a national director of programs or um, a division of program directors that to them, they could potentially, you know, hopefully get you down to the the point of contact in your local community. Um, smaller organizations may have um, a paid staff, or they might just have a, a volunteer leader. At the local level, typically these organizations have a, a president, a president or a commander at the local level, and that's going to be your point of contact. On the state level, they may or may not have have a um, might have a unpaid director that kind of oversees programs within the state, or it might be a volunteer leader. And if you want to start at that state level, then they can provide you contact at your level. And one that you're going to Get a committee chair, basically um, who's to be in charge at the local level. You're going to start with a possibly you know a public relations or a some type of program committee chair, and then they're going to, as Bob said, you know the the structure. Uh, it takes a while sometimes to work through their hierarchy. So you may start with that committee chair, then they're going to take that information back to their local committee and probably present um, information on uh, your organization um, to that. And touching on one of the questions that we saw over there, um, that seem to be kind of resistant. Again, it's, it's kind of that one-on-one -on -one information to uh, who you are because we're developing these relationships on a national level, but locally they may not be familiar with who RSVP is or who your, uh, you know, specific program that you're affiliated with. So it's it's kind of in that introductory thing, that kind of one-on-one -on -one, that here's who we are, and here's you know what the types of or program and organization and stuff that we are, and just kind of developing that relationship. And it may take a little time. As Bob said, some of, you know, it's been kind of that insular um, that they've operated, that they've been providing the services, and the thought that, wow, here's a whole other group of volunteers that might want to come in um, and participate with us, that's them. So it may take you a little time to develop that relationship, but come from the standpoint that, your program has been around for 30 years, but that doesn't mean that they're familiar with who you are. I mean, you're learning who they are, and they're getting information from about you, about your program. So approach it from that standpoint, not, you know, coming in from the standpoint that, well, you should know who we are, because they may not. So, you know, it's really all about developing those relationships at, and starting from there. That we've to the next one. Hello. Um, yeah, Teresa's introduced us nicely, and that's about um, introducing oneself. First. Again, I would know 
know, know what you want, but don't necessarily put it on the table immediately. Um, I encourage in these kind of new starts as uh, telephone calls if the if you can find the telephone number for the local contact if all you're getting by your referring source of email then or a, on the spot mail address then use those methods but um, if you have an opportunity to make a personal hoe um, could visit you in the near future about this and so um, that would be I think a, a, um, a smoother way to go than a cold call email to uh, some, some organization in the community from another that's like we've never heard of each other. Um, the service organizations typically don't know what this whole thing is. National service. I mean, veterans have been the, the older ones have been doing this since World War One. So this idea that there's like a whole national service and there's a movement and there's a federal agency that's unclear to to them um, and not universally but it may be unfamiliar to many so assume that free knowledge that, that we've been an RSVP agency since the Johnson administration they're like I never heard of RP or VISTA or foster grandparent I don't know what that is um, the other thing is that some, of, on the other hand, some of your some veterans may be participants in national service programs. And so, if you know who's in your volunteer base, um, figure out if any of them belong to any of these groups. Use them as your link and your ambassador. Bring them along as an example of, of here's someone who belongs to you and belongs to us. Um, so definitely. And knowing knowing what you knowing what you want to achieve, or at least and not knowing for sure, but having some handle on it, so it's not just a hey, gotta know each other, just so we know each other. It's not becoming so specific at the outset that it feels intimidating, and um, so that why I would encourage a personal meeting, um, and also a great way to introduce um, them to your organization is to invite them in activities that you. So if you're having a community event where there's an opportunity to recognize um, leaders from the community on a podium or rostrum or a guest table or whatever, that, that's a great way to do um, something that, um, that's facilitated and soft. The other is um, veteran groups have um, members that are prepared to do flag presentations and color color guard moments. So if there if you see an opportunity in one of your events to incorporate that into the session, it's a nice way to make an introduction of your organization to a veterans group around a service they provide in the community and it doesn't maybe about the, the service that you're seeking to collaborate on, but it taps their quality and strength and gets them in your midst. Next slide. And just kind of as Bob identify, you know, putting together your proposal when you're coming to them, you want to, um, if possible, identify a specific project or area. Um, not just that, hey, we want to work together, but what is the, the specific activity if you have in mind? Um, and so then kind of develop your plan of action and who's going to be responsible for what. And if you can provide a, a time for action, I mean, Sometimes their decision-making process in a veteran service organization may take a while. If, you, if you're meeting with a committee chairman, then they're going to have to take that back to the the overall group, and then they're going to have to meet and stuff. So you can develop a specific timeline ahead of time, that, and then you know that when they're coming in that you know if you're looking for you know a specific activity and when it's going to take place so that they know that. That kind of can help drive their their decision-making process. Um, as Bob said, um, you know, can exchange the letters. I mean, if you're if you're going, if you're an RSVP program, you want to formalize that with like a random or 
if their organization, they're going to need a resolution or something. And then by all means, you want to announce the collaboration to the public so that people know that you know you're going to be working together that just provides increased awareness for your program as well as theirs um, and it need being you know if you're if you're you know with the proposal and you've got the uh, the expertise then you can offer guidance on how to actually get the project implemented for that um, so we can move on because we're getting close to the time so we'll make sure that you know we have time to answer questions or Anything. So, anybody has an example of collaboration that you've done? If you want to share that in the the chat function, so that we can can chat with everyone. People are, yeah, well, people are powering up through that. I open phones too, but um, just one example that we put together is uh, um, to get. Did one is that um, USO and United through reading collaborate. So USO is some it's a service organization, and United through reading the national nonprofit organization, and United through reading offers opportunities to connect parents to their children through reading when there's a distance between the parent and the child, and they were doing this work in um, with um, incarcerated patients to be able to have some engagement with their children and, and some other um, isolated um, type situations, and United Through Reading saw an opportunity for service members to and their children to benefit from a similar engagement, and so they had the, the um, they had the program model. They had the um, con. The, they had the pro model. They had the um, relationships with booksellers and other providers of books. They had um, the methods for the technology, um, but they needed a, a method to get a mechanism to get to the service member population. So, what better for them than to collaborate with USO, which has over a thousand locations around the country, including overseas locations, but also domestic where they have direct daily access to service members. So that's a really simple example where one group has service, one had an interest in expanding that service to the military community, and other organizations had access to the military community but didn't have that service, and so they came together and now how United Through Reading project specifically for service members. So um, there we go. Um, so I'll take it back to Eric to tell us how to use the time that we the best. And thanks for sharing that uh, great example. And as Bob and Teresa invited you, please do, um, if you can describe a successful collaboration you yourself are managing or that you know of, we'd We'd love to hear about it in the chat. I think the amount of time we have remaining, we should maybe go ahead and make sure folks are aware of some resources. Uh, and then if folks have a little extra time, and if our presenters do as well, we can stick around a little bit for our official end time, um, 30 Pacific. So uh, let's make sure we leave you with some help information. And I I think Margie and Bob will lead us through um, some resources. Okay. Um, so there's contact information for both myself and Teresa. So our phone numbers, email addresses, and websites are there. So that, that's pretty clear. Uh, next slide is um, to alert you to a, a learn opportunity called the Community Blueprint Summit for Change. It it's a pre-conference to the National Conference on Volunteering and Service, which is scheduled June 17th and 18th, 12th. The um, main conference is June 18th through 20th. It's Chicago, Illinois, and um, registration information as well as program information is um, at the Volunteering and Service website. The um, Community Blueprint Summit for Change is the opportunity for you to have an intense to 
a collaboration building um, project that's administered by Points of Light called the Community Blueprint Network. And um, that what tells you a little bit more what that is. So um, they're coming to the NCV already. Consider adding Sunday to your itinerary. And um, otherwise, there are some main sessions as well in the veteran and military track. Hope to meet some of you at, at the conference. Um, you have this slide, Margie. Bob, as you can tell, there are many, many resources available to you, and many of them are currently housed on the Veterans and Military Family Knowledge Network, which is run out of the National Service Resource Center. We do encourage you to visit this site. We have set up a special forum for discussion on this very topic, and we welcome your questions and comments. If you have pose some very specific questions, which will require me to do a little bit of research. When we finish with this webinar, we'll take these questions, divide them up, and get the answers, and we'll post those answers back on the Knowledge Network. And we hope that, that you'll please visit that network. You're welcome to join, because that's where you can find out uh, what kinds of information is available and what tools are available, for example, for recruiting veterans because we do have a toolkit up there. You'll also be able to have conversations with others who are engaged in this work. Okay, so thank you very much. This is the Knowledge Network. We invite you all to join and to pose your questions there as well as to do some um, information gathering. We have another webinar coming up. As I said, we have these once a month. Some of them are general information to help you in your work. And others are going to be focusing on particular programs or program models. And, and this one on Wednesday the 7th is going to be uh, featuring our colleagues in Montana and some of their work with uh, rural veterans. So I encourage you to join that conversation and invite your friends, the more the merrier. The other comments from our presenters? I, I, I just want to emphasize, as Margie said, that the questions that you post in chat, I'll um, be happy to answer. I think that's a fabulous suggestion to put them in writing on your um, on on the Knowledge Network, and that way everyone can feel I'm fully satisfied, just not um, not what we accomplish in the next couple of minutes. So we're absolutely mm -hmm. all three of us, as was Edu Northwest, committed to your. Um, committed to your success and your future learning and, and learning from you. So um, thank you all. For, I'm so impressed with how many participants we've had today, and I think it's a, a very bright day for the military and veteran community to see this much um, energy and passion and desire to serve from, from, from those of you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. And, Teresa, thank you, too. We know that this is something that's, um, very near and dear to both of your hearts. Yeah, just echo the comments. Thank you all so much for for joining us today and, and for all the work that you're doing within your communities. And, and um, anything that, that you know we can do to help you, feel free to give us a you know a call or send us an email. And with that, we've reached the official end time of our webinar, so we want to let you get back to that good work that you're doing in your communities. So we go. Um, we will, when we post the recording of the session, we'll also provide a copy of the slides, although hopefully you also received a copy earlier this morning or yesterday. But if not, we'll make sure there's a copy available for you. So uh, as was mentioned, we'll follow up and get to some of those questions we weren't able to get to now. Um, please do complete the evaluation that will pop up when you exit out of WebEx. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And with that, we will officially end the webinar. Thank you, everyone.